My name is Tyler Clinton, and I'd want to tell you my tale. Before I begin, let me state that I am not even a distant relative of the former president. However, the irony of his behavior during his administration never ceases to amaze me. Why your spouse refused to be faithful to her vows while claiming to want to stay married is a question I never imagined asking. So here I am, sitting on my back porch on a cool May evening, waiting for my soon-to-be ex-wife, who has just been served with divorce papers by her employer, to burst through the door. I'm assuming how she'll react, but I'm not entirely certain because I believe she's gone crazy. The revelation of her infidelity occurred three weeks ago on April 28th. I'll get back to it in a little. We selected the back porch because it is private. We live on a two-acre property, so even if there is shouting outside, the neighbors are unlikely to hear. A private detective is also stationed around the corner, keeping an eye out. He's there to protect us in case one of us loses our cool and snaps. Lindsay Lynn is both intelligent and attractive, in my opinion. We met while attending graduate school in Chicago. I was pursuing an MBA in medical and public health. She was obtaining a CR in a degree that, for readers outside the medical field, indicates she was studying to become a nurse anesthetist. She spent two years working in the neonatal unit, working long hours, a great deal of emotional pressure. Nurse anesthetists normally work relatively normal hours, beginning at 6 a.m. to 5 p.m., four days a week for significantly more money and less stress. Lynn's one potential negative was that she gets bored fast and is constantly looking for new experiences. We were enjoying the music, and she was planning for the next weekend. Anything new was appealing, whether it was a new app, a new acquaintance, or a new restaurant. Her attention was continually piqued. We talked about it during our courting, and I made it plain that I was open to trying new things. But when it came to marriage, I was a traditionalist. I believe that even after years of being in the same relationship, you may discover something new every day. If you put your whole heart into it, she never offered me any cause to believe she disagreed. I insisted on signing a prenuptial agreement because her changeable disposition tended to roam from the familiar to the unfamiliar. She was not pleased with the proposal, believing it was an affront to her character. I emphasized that it was a bilateral agreement that equally protected her as it did me. She gave in and signed the agreement. The wealth gained throughout the marriage was split 50-50, with everyone keeping 100% of what they brought in and 80-20 if the reason for the dissolution was infidelity. To be honest, once we signed it, neither of us gave it any thought until lately. We relocated from Chicago to Des Moines, Iowa following our wedding. Low cost of living, a solid economy, a busy and expanding downtown, and excellent professional prospects in healthcare. Cold winters, usually warm spring and fall summers that can range from extremely nice to nearly brutally scorching. Unlike our southern neighbors, St. Louis, Des Moines does not have a high humidity. Even on sweltering summer days, the evenings are always refreshingly cool, and the sweet corn in July and August is fantastic. It is also the birthplace of Pinterest's creator, Ben Silberman. What more do you require? We've both enjoyed fulfilling work for the past eight years, a lovely residence. We really enjoyed our neighbors and friends. And up until three weeks ago, I thought I had a strong marriage. I said solid, not ideal. Nobody has a flawless marriage because there are no perfect people on earth. We occasionally thought, I'm a convinced toothpaste squeezer from the bottom. And she acts haphazardly. She wants the dishes scrubbed and the kitchen clean every night while I'm happy to pack the dishwasher for three or four days before running it. Yes, we, like every other couple in America, could argue over little matters, but much more frequently. We went for lengthy walks in the evening and had long chats on the porch, short weekend vacations to the cabin or to a favorite performance in Chicago, Minneapolis, or Dallas were regular. We enjoyed each other and spoke openly and honestly about what we loved and disliked. At least that's what I received. We were both 34, we knew that children were on the way, and we were excited to be mom and dad whenever they arrived. You may be asking, am I really a failure in bed and just don't want to admit it? Is Lynn absolutely attractive and being courted by every male I meet? Perhaps we've already contemplated open marriage. Did I overlook the warning flags at the start of our relationship that Lynn would turn into a slut? Maybe I cheated on her, and she's simply seeking vengeance. Is her lover as attached to her as a horse? She is trapped, like the Greek Adonis. 
Is she adjusting her financial situation? Let me tell you all in order. First, Lynn appears to be happy with our life together. I've never been labeled the best, but I've worked hard to give as much as I've received, and I've never heard anyone complain. Second, she is a very beautiful woman with a sharp wit and a strong intellect. Her nationality is Irish, Italian, a blonde brunette standing five feet eight inches tall. Third, I don't recall any warning signals, but if I'm not foolish, I guess I got what I deserved for falling asleep when the switch was flipped. Maybe I should have paid more attention to her fascination with the new fourth. I have never touched another lady except to say hello or goodbye since we started dating. Fifth, I believe the truthful response is that he is handsome, but I wouldn't say he was gorgeous to death. He's approximately my height. Six of the same build, approximately pound 180. Trim and strong, but not ripped. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Sixth, he is only 28. A medical student who has spent the last two months working in the operating room. Seventh, he'll make money someday. But since she makes $100,000 and I make twice that, I don't see the appeal of cash, fancy cars, or a luxurious home. He won't begin making serious money for another 10 years. So, as you might expect, I have no idea how we got here. But maybe I should explain what transpired over the last three weeks. It was the last week of April, and I was in Kansas City for a three-day medical administration conference. I was supposed to be there for four days, but when I looked through the workshop offerings on the final day, there was nothing that piqued my interest. It had already been a great week. On the first day, I met three other people from my region who were in similar situations. We eventually formed a small team and gathered every night to compare notes. I enjoyed the camaraderie, networked, exchanged contact information, and laughed over a couple beers. Later on the third day, I informed them that I would be leaving first thing in the morning. I skipped air travel and drove myself because the trip took less than three hours. Interstate 35 is a relatively quiet highway, with less traffic than most others. On the way, I listened to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast on World War I. Missouri's only president founded a fantastic World War I museum in Kansas City. Carlin gave me some information before I went on a tour and attended the seminar's first session, President Harry S. Truman. By the way, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what this country is all about, I was able to drive at my leisure because I assumed I was on my way home to my loving wife, who was on her first day of a three-day vacation. I got up early and was on the road by 5 a.m. I planned to wake her up pleasantly around 8 a.m. Lynn's car wasn't in the driveway when I arrived home. She drives a 2018 Honda Accord with crystal black pearlescent paint and never parks in the garage unless it's raining. It has not rained in a week. If the car isn't in the driveway, it's not at home. I was slightly perplexed. We exercise at the same gym, Lifetime Fitness, so she couldn't go for a run. She always sleeps on her first day off, but when I entered the house, I didn't notice she was there last night. The bed was made, which rarely happens unless it's Saturday laundry day. The refrigerator showed no signs of leftovers from the previous night's dinner. It made a suggestion. I called Lynn, but it went straight to voicemail. Luckily, we both have Glimpse on our phones, a navigation tracking system that works on any iPhone. I opened the app and saw that her phone was somewhere near the airport. What? We live in northeast Des Moines, near a private golf course called The Harvester. We both love golf and chose our home based in part on joining this club. The airport was on the southwest side of town. I was starting to get a little nervous and decided that if she answered, I would play dumb. I just asked how she was doing. I figured it wouldn't occur to her this early in the day to look at the glimpse to confirm my location. I waited 15 minutes, then called her a second time, she answered, and that's when my world started to fall apart. Hi, babe, she said in a sleepy voice. Why are you calling me so early on my day off? I'm sorry, Lynn. I apologized, somehow keeping my composure. I miss you, and I had some time before my morning seminar. Just wanted to hear your voice. I realized from the background noise that she was sitting up in bed, not in our bed. It's fine. I'm always happy to talk to my favorite husband. Looks like you're still in bed, so I won't keep you up. Just wanted to tell you that I love you and I'll be home no later than dinner tomorrow night. Unless you want me to miss my last day and rush home. That would be fantastic. But as soon as I wake up, I'm going to run errands right away and then have dinner with Kim and Sally tonight. We arranged it two weeks in advance, so I can't interfere with them. The girls were two of her co-workers. 
She didn't say anything to imply that she wasn't at home in our bed, so I had to think fast. Okay, sweetie, I'm letting you go. Hey, before you hang up, could you check the top drawer of my nightstand and tell me if I left the pen you gave me for my birthday in there? I don't have it, and I'm scared I could have lost it. It was in my shirt pocket. Tie. Honey, I really want to roll over and go back to sleep. Can I check that and call you back before I head to lunch? Wrong answer. I knew I'd generally got something similar. I'll check, but I won't be thrilled if it's not there and you lose my gift. My heart was thumping hard in my chest, yet nevertheless I preserved my calm. Yes, Lynn, just remember to check. I will let you go back to sleep. Sorry again for waking you up. Thank you, babe. I will call you in a few minutes. I love you. I couldn't think of anything to say at this point. I also love you. I hung up the phone and went to my car, hoping for the best but expecting the worst. It took 40 minutes to get from our house to the airport. I made it in 30 minutes and was lucky not to get pulled over for speeding. Every time I checked the app, her phone remained stationary. If she checked hers and discovered I was getting close, we'd get into a fight. However, I knew she was completely engrossed. She would simply assume I was telling her the truth and never bother to check the location of my phone, regardless of who provided her with her new experience. The GPS directed me to the Hampton Inn, which was just down the street from the DSM. I parked at the far end of the lot, away from the few cars left in front of the hotel. After a few moments, I realized Lynn would recognize my car if he saw it, so I moved to the Quality Inn's adjacent parking lot. I chose a location where I could watch the arrivals and departures from the Hamptons' front door, but not where she might notice my dark blue, the Genesis G70. I did not have a plan. I fought back the tears that kept welling up in my eyes. Was she actually cheating on me? Whom are you with? And why had she thrown away eight years of what I had thought to be a strong and committed relationship? Was she seduced? And would she be embarrassed if it was discovered? Is there an innocent explanation for her lies and deception? If she just wanted to pamper herself until I got home, she would go to the Marriott downtown or the Deluxe. But why pamper herself when she has a hot tub and pool at home? Furthermore, her abuser was only ten minutes away from home and she adored her. None of this contributed to innocence. I had been agonizing over this for about an hour when she arrived with Justin Banks. As they walked out, they held hands and kissed each other passionately. Damn, damn, damn. That young medical student kept my wife entertained. I took a few quick photos with my phone as they separated for a more passionate kiss before getting into his car. I met him around two months ago at a hospital appointment. I like most people and can easily find common ground with them, but Justin seemed like a jerk to me. Lynn introduced us to one another. He squeezed his hand even tighter during the handshake as if to demonstrate his dominance. My father had always taught me to look my conversation partner in the eyes and extend a firm hand. So I was unimpressed. Our small talk was staged, and he appeared to be smirking constantly. I mentioned this to Lynn on the way home, and she dismissed it. You spend a lot of time with doctors, Ty, and you know how narcissistic they can be. Justin is not like that right now in the parking lot. As he watches my marriage heat up, I had trouble keeping my emotions under control. What do I do? go to court and hire a private investigator. I had to consider it. Because the majority of my job entails problem solving, I forced myself to relax and think. After a few minutes, I had a plan in place and decided to take a chance. When they left the Hamptons, they didn't have overnight luggage. They did not appear to be checking out. Perhaps they planned to eat something first and then return for an afternoon treat. I used the Glimpse app to confirm that they had stopped at a nearby diner about two miles away. I had a few minutes to react. I returned to the Hamptons and entered the lobby. Fortunately, it was empty, save for a middle-aged woman working the front desk. When I approached, she looked up and smiled. Good morning. So, what can I do for you? I quickly checked her name tag and noticed she was wearing a wedding ring. Hi, Beth. Hello, my name is Tyler. I'm having a problem and I'm hoping you can help. Tyler, I'm glad to meet you, and I'll be happy to assist if I can. Do you have a reservation? And would you like to come by early? No, Beth, I answered quietly and seriously. The couple who left approximately 15 minutes ago, a brunette woman and a younger blonde man. Did you see them? Her happy expression turned serious. Yes, I did notice them. What exactly is the problem? I'm afraid I've got Beth. The lady is my wife and the young man works with her. Unfortunately, I suspect they are cheating on me behind my back. 
I'm not sure how I can help you, sir, she said with a confused expression on her face. The majority of Iowans are friendly and neighborly. They also have a habit of keeping to themselves. Beth, I'd like to look inside the room they're in. I'm not going to cause a scene at your hotel. I just need to verify my suspicions. I'm not asking for Urumki. I'm perfectly fine with someone from housekeeping letting me into the room and making sure I don't stay longer than two minutes. I simply need to check. I'm sorry to ask you to do this, but I see your ring and know you understand how a spouse would feel in this situation. Beth contemplated for a moment. You appear to be a trustworthy man. The couple did strike me as strange, but what others do is none of my business. I do understand your concerns, however. Could you tell me what the woman's name is? She put them on her credit card. Yes, of course. Her name is Lindsay Clinton, and she most likely used an American Express gold card. I can even provide you with the phone number if you prefer. I appreciate your attention to detail and discretion, which appeared to be effective. A minute later, the Amex number was confirmed. Can you contact the housekeeping team? I inquired. No need, she said. She said, Thomas, loudly. Thomas, a porter, appeared around the corner. Yeah, Beth. Thomas, I'll be away from the counter for about five minutes. I'll be on the third floor. You're in charge until I come back. Thomas appeared to have just been given command of the White House. Yes, ma'am. Beth winked at me and instructed me to follow her. We rode the elevator to the third floor silently. We had no idea how to make small talk after one of us had just received potentially devastating news. We made our way down the hallway and came to a halt in front of room 319. Beth presented the key card to the reader. I was hoping she'd hit read and not let me in. Green, no such luck. When I walked in, Beth was standing in the doorway, holding the door open. Iowans are also practical. If I turned out to be a psychopath, Beth would be easily persuaded to leave. Looking around the room, I noticed clothes scattered about, including a man's casual button-down shirt and khakis, as well as loafers and a belt tossed on this side of the bed. Moving to the far side, I saw what I expected. I hoped it wasn't the light beige blouse I had bought for Lynn's last birthday. And a short dark blue skirt, trying to think clearly, I decided that pictures and videos of the room would be useful. I'm not a lawyer, or I would have known that a two-foot ambulance chaser could throw the entire thing out, assuming it was all set up by me, unaware of this legal nuance. I scanned the room for about 60 seconds of videotape, narrating my observations. I'm in room 319 of the Moines Airport Marriott Hotel. It's 5 to 10 a.m. on Thursday, April 28, 2022. My wife, Lindsay Clinton, booked and paid for my hotel room with her American Express gold card, number 55517339184520. Don't ask me why I memorize the card numbers. I simply do. She checked into a room last night with Justin Banks, a medical student at her hospital. According to the ambiance and odor in the room, my wife and Justin cheated on me from last night until this morning. I noticed them leaving the Hamptons about 15 minutes ago. They were kissing and holding hands. I've got two pictures to prove it. I quickly checked out the bathroom, but there wasn't much to see before leaving. I decided to gather a few items to take with me. Otherwise, I could bring them in for DNA testing. Not that I would be surprised by what I discovered— Furthermore, Lynn might become concerned if he couldn't find them. As Beth and I entered the elevator, I started losing control over myself. I was crying. Beth, a kind woman from Iowa, placed her hand on my shoulder and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Clinton. We exited the elevator into the lobby and I began reaching for my wallet. Don't think about it, son. She spoke in a tone that left no room for disagreement. I smiled, thanked her and said, I know I shouldn't say this, but if you interact with them, please don't give them any indication that I was there. Her lips lifted into the shape of a smirk. She winked and said, I've never seen or heard of you in my life, and I'm offended that you would think otherwise. As you can see, my plan is no longer in effect. What should we do next? I've already stated that I have no legal knowledge. However, even with my limited understanding of divorce in the United States, I knew that if I filed for divorce too soon, I would be in big trouble. Despite the prenup, this was the bad news. The good news was that I wasn't due home until late Friday night. I had some free time to think and plan. Because I was on the south side of town, I drove another 30 miles southeast to the small town of Winterset and arrived at Rudy's Restaurant on John Wayne Drive 40 minutes later. 
Winterset is the Duke's hometown, and there's even a small museum dedicated to him. I know this because my father, who could recite every John Wayne film by heart, used to bring my brother and me here as kids and sit us in a booth in the back row. I saw a quote from his most recent film on the wall. In the film, The Rifleman, Wayne portrayed an elderly gunfighter dying of cancer who was determined to go out with a gun in his hand and his boots on. I will not be hurt if a terrible disease consumes him until he dies. I refuse to be insulted. I will not have my hand raised to me. I don't do this to others and expect the same from them. I'm not as much of a Duke fan as my father was. I am more like Clint Eastwood from Josie Wales's Outlaw, but I found myself laughing. Damn right, Pilgrim, I said it out loud. I'm not addressing anyone in particular, but the waitress who approached my table heard my best Wayne impersonation. She simply rolled her eyes and responded in her best Duke accent. So, young man, would you like some snacks? I ordered coffee and a full breakfast. I felt better after doing something as simple as enjoying food. As I sat and ate, I looked up and read a few articles about cheating spouses. Experts believe this is not an isolated case. They would never be so friendly if it was just a drunken one-night stand. In the United States, women cheating on their husbands are rarely a one-time occurrence. It had probably been going on for a long time, but I had no evidence that anything was about to change. So I started compiling a list. I was never going to stay married to a cheating husband, no matter how recent it was. I could forgive and possibly hold some love in my heart. But all trust had been lost forever. Even with a prenuptial agreement, I would hire someone to assist me in obtaining proof. I needed solid legal advice from someone who understood the financial side of the situation. I needed to get checked for STDs. Justin Banks was bound to get infected, one way or the other. I had approximately 36 hours to take action. I finished my breakfast and gave the server a $50 tip for a $16 breakfast. At least one person in the Des Moines area would have a pleasant day. I texted Lynn before leaving the diner. Sorry, I discovered my pen at the bottom of my satchel. She responded just a moment later. Good luck to you. I responded with six words. Screw you, bitch, cheating whore. I didn't do it, but it was so tempting. I simply responded, and two hours later I found myself in the Templeton, Sharp, and Schaefer offices. I'd met Templeton previously at a charity event and knew he practiced family law. He returned my call and listened patiently to my story. I'm sorry to hear this, Mr. Clinton. Thank you, Mr. Templeton. Please refer to me as Tyler. Fine. Tyler. I'm Edward. Added to my friends and clients, so you can call me Ed. I appreciate it, sir. Tyler, I'm not just picking on you. Legally, your situation is not ideal. The absence of children is beneficial, but the absence of fault means you may need to seek counseling or speak with your spouse in order for the court to determine whether the marriage is truly broken. If the prenuptial agreement was properly drafted, you may be able to avoid financial loss, but this remains to be seen. I'd like to refer you to Eli Sharp, my partner. In our business, he is a divorce expert. We will do our best for you. Let me put you in touch with his assistant, Diane, and she will handle everything. An hour later, I was already in his office. I found out that Eli Sharp lived up to his name, a short guy who was only five or ten years old and weighed around pound 130. From what I understand, he was an avid swimmer since he was a child. He had numerous school records in his home state of Indiana. He still swam an hour six times per week. After only ten minutes with him, it was clear that he had spent his life proving that being small does not guarantee victory in battle. He brought the same attitude to his legal practice. He listened carefully to everything I had said so far. I asked a few clarifying questions before suggesting some initial strategies. Are they still at the Hamptons today? I honestly don't know. Don't worry. I am able to find out. Sorry. He picked up the phone and said, Diane, please put me through to Molly and tell her I need to know if Lindsay Clinton has booked room 319 at the Hampton Hotel in D.C. and by tomorrow morning. If so, please tell me everything. I need a complete report by noon tomorrow and ask her not to miss anything. What? Yes, I know it will irritate her, but that is part of the fun, isn't it? He put the phone back on its stand. Molly Baker is the best private investigator this side of Chicago because she spent 18 years as a private investigator in Chicago before quitting and moving to Des Moines. What she saw in the Windy City would make your toes curl. Anyway, if they arrive today, we'll have a lot of information by tomorrow. He agreed that I should be tested for STDs. 
but he was concerned about the time it would take to get results. He assumed my wife would want to engage in sexual activity with me in order to hide her tracks. I reassured him that I knew several doctors in my field and might be able to speed up the tests. The usual five to ten days could be reduced to two or three. I called my buddy, Dr. Stan Rosen, and asked if I could come by in the morning. Eli also set me up with a forensic accountant from their firm. The next morning, he gave me a printout of what he knew I'd need to bring, including our prenup. Finally, he stated that if your wife changes her plans and arrives home tonight, you will be unable to attend or confront her. We will address it as soon as we have the facts and determine the best course of action. But that won't happen until next week, at the most. If my suspicions are correct, it will probably take us a few weeks to discover the infidelity. It may not help us in court, but it will not harm us. The majority of Temoin justices of the peace continue to oppose marital infidelity, so you should be on your best behavior. Be respectful and courteous to maintain health. Pretend you're sick if she wants to do it at any time over the weekend. Aside from that, everything remains as usual. So you're telling me that calling her a name and hitting Justin with a baseball bat are not acceptable? That's right. Seriously, can you do it? Anything stupid would bring us down. Yeah, you've got my word. That's sufficient. We shook hands and I departed. I wish I could say I knew how to express my pain, but that would be a lie. I still had my clothes from the trip, so I didn't have to go inside. I went to another gym, bought a day pass, and worked out for about two hours until I could stand in my seat. Then I took a long, steamy shower before checking into the Hyatt Hotel downtown, where I immediately ordered room service. My purchase included a bottle of Maker's Mark. After my second drink, I turned off my phone and put it in the closet. Knowing that once I drank, I'd forget where I was. I didn't want to risk calling my whore wife while intoxicated. Tears, anger, frustration, and more tears continued until I passed out. The next morning, around 7 a.m., I awoke with the worst hangover I'd had since graduating from college and forced myself back to the gym. I drank a long, steamy sip from my Yeti glass, which was filled with ice and more makers. Whoever devised the remedy for the morning bite, the dog that bit you must have known something. Because after my shower, I felt nearly human again. I spent an hour at the local Starbucks with my laptop, preparing a financial report for the accountant. I arrived at Rosen's office around 8.30 a.m. I explained the circumstances to him, and he drew my blood himself. I'll personally deliver it to the lab and have the results returned to me. I'll have to include your name on them. However, doctor-patient confidentiality will protect them until you need them in court. This isn't your first rodeo, doctor. Hell no, buddy, he said in his best duck voice. Everyone here seemed to love John Wayne. I could get the results tomorrow by the end of the day, but it could be Monday. I can't put a lot of pressure on the lab staff. No worries. Thanks, Stan. Back at the TSNS, I sat down at the desk with Lois Montgomery. She sorted through everything, kicked all the tires, and examined my financial situation. For about two hours. It was about as pleasant as a prostate exam. When we finished, she took a deep breath and began to summarize. Mr. Clinton... There's both good and bad news. The prenuptial agreement protects 80% of your assets in the event of an adultery-based divorce, but I don't see you getting much more than 50-50 on the house. You can also avoid alimony and, of course, will not pay it, but you may have to split your retirement savings. I'll write a full report and deliver it to Eli by the end of the day. I thanked her and went upstairs to see Eli Sharp again. He was sitting and conversing with a woman who appeared to be in her late 40s. Molly Elkington was a pleasant-looking woman with short brown hair, dark brown eyes, and a friendly smile. Her handshake was firm, and her stare was intense. I felt compelled to give an honest response to any of her questions. Her gaze was so powerful. Molly's jacket was hanging from the back of a chair, and I noticed a gun on her belt. I made a note to myself not to mess with that woman. Following a brief exchange of pleasantries, Iowans recall that they were always friendly. She cut straight to the chase. Mr. Clinton, your wife is in a relationship with medical student Justin Banks. Thank you to a lovely woman named Beth. I was able to install audiovisual devices in their Hampton hotel room. She paused and raised her eyes from her notes. By the way, Beth asked me to mention that she has a lovely niece in Cedar Bluffs that you might be interested in meeting in the future. 
I converted some of the videotapes into photographs and enhanced the images to make your wife's identity absolutely clear. They returned to the hotel around one o'clock yesterday afternoon and stayed there until six o'clock when they went out to dinner. They ate at a Chinese restaurant in West Des Moines before heading back to the Hampton around eight o'clock. According to my boyfriend in the lobby, they checked out of the hotel around ten banks. He got into his car, she got into hers. Mrs. Clinton returned home and is still there. She passed me a large file folder across the table. There are photographs and a thumb drive with video on it. I do not recommend that you look at these at all, but if you do, give yourself some time and space to process what you will see and hear. I am deeply sorry for Mr. Clinton. I despise cheaters for what they are and the harm they cause. I did some research on you as well, and it became clear to me that you do not deserve the way your wife betrays you. She and Shap exchanged a few more comments and ideas for how to proceed in the coming weeks to establish a pattern. She then stood up, put on her jacket, shook my hand, wished me well, and walked out the door. Sharp went to his cabinet and poured me a shot of Knob Creek Limited Edition to settle my nerves. I gulped it down and prepared to continue our conversation. We talked about several aspects of the situation. I updated him on my blood tests and we talked about the financial aspects of our impending divorce. Tyler, what's your ultimate goal? What's most important to you when the dust settles? I pondered for a moment. I would like to leave as soon as possible. I can be patient and refrain from making stupid decisions. But just thinking about being around her makes me nauseated. I really want you to do everything you can to ensure that the terms of the prenuptial agreement are followed. I can deal with the division of the house and other minor assets, but there is no way I want her to come out of this in a good financial position at my expense. Furthermore, I'd like to keep what little dignity I have left. I want it known that she was unfaithful, it's not me. There are no irreconcilable differences. I don't want to go after the hospital because I work there. To be honest, I don't see any fault with Unity Point Healthcare. However, I'd like to make it clear that she and I broke up because she was having fun with Justin Banks behind my back. Finally, I want to punish Banks. I'm not sure if you can persuade the hospital that it's in their best interest to remove him from their program but I really want him to spend the rest of his life driving a United Parcel Service truck in Goodland, Kansas, Sharp replied to each. First and foremost, I believe you are satisfied with the prenuptial agreement. I'm feeling cautiously optimistic. Second, we will ensure that the reason for the breakup is communicated to everyone. However, the court may order counseling to determine whether the marriage can be saved. Assuming your wife has no interest in divorce, I'd be surprised if her lawyer doesn't support it. They are likely to act aggressively, if for no other reason than to drag out the case in the hope of softening you up and convincing you to change your mind. Finally, you should be cautious about your expectations that your banking career will suffer. You are right. The hospital can reduce its losses, particularly if incoming students sign a pledge to behave during training. However, I wouldn't get my hopes up about that. Tyler, You'll need to return home within the next day or so. You may be able to find an excuse to spend the majority of the weekend away, but you must return as soon as possible and play the happy husband as if your life depends on it. We risk her going on the offensive before we're fully prepared if we even hint at what we know. I take you at your word that you will never go near banks under any circumstances. If you think you're going to break, I'll call Molly and ask her to put one of her guys on you for a while. I assured the lawyer that I would behave properly, even if it meant biting my lip until it bled. I left Sharp's office early on Friday afternoon. I sat in my car for 30 minutes, trying to figure out how to drive home without rambling. I couldn't see a way to succeed, so I did the next best thing I could. I rejoined southbound Interstate 35 heading toward Kansas City. Lynn was waiting for me at home around 7 o'clock. After about 90 minutes of driving... I arrived in the small town of Bethany, Missouri, and found the local tire shop. Behind the counter was a 40-year-old man wearing a shirt with the name Ed stitched on it. He appeared to be content reading Sports Illustrated and was not in the mood to deal with work late on a Friday night, as if I didn't care. Can I assist you? Yeah, I am in need of four new tires. Ed took a deep breath in frustration. Apparently, the Chiefs' offensive line situation for the following season was more appealing than making money. He stood up and went to my car. These tires have at least 10,000 miles left to go. You don't require new treads. He appeared upset. 
He had no notion what genuine dissatisfaction looked like. Look, Ed, I'm a little crazy about my automobile and I don't mind the price. Can you put new tires on it? He murmured to himself as he walked back into the home and turned on his 2005 desktop. Not today, but I can get them in by 10 a.m. tomorrow. He then took out a little calculator for shipment, installation, and taxes. It will cost you $1,455. Great, I said, do it. He looked at me as if I had three heads and still typed the order. Okay, we're done. I will see you in the morning, without awaiting a response. He returned to his SI article. I returned to the highway and checked into the Super 8 Motel, which cost $1.78 per night. I plopped down on the uncomfortable bed and called Lynn. You are almost home, babe. I cannot wait to see you. She felt upbeat after two days of fun with Justin. Sorry, Lynn. I lied because I just blew two tires on the highway by running over some debris that fell off a semi-trailer. I'm stranded in a small Missouri town named Bethany. They can install new tires on me, but not until tomorrow. I won't get home till the middle of the day, in case you wish to invite Justin over tonight and sleep together in our marriage bed. I did not say the last statement out, but I really wanted to. Damn. Ty, are you all right? Nothing hit the windshield or anything? No, I'm all right, but I'm eating Taco Bell for dinner tonight and brunch in the morning. I apologize for the delay, Lynn. I agree. But the most essential thing is that you are okay. I really miss you and was hoping. Tonight, jump on your bones. I believe I can wait till tomorrow. Please stay safe for the remainder of the journey and return home to your lovely wife as soon as possible, Buster. I will then. I apologize, but I'm a little weary and still woozy from the blast. I'm going to drink these two bottles of beer I bought at the Jiffy Mart before retiring to bed. I will see you tomorrow, okay? Okay, Ty, I love you. Good night, Lynn. I knew I'd have to lie some more and answer to them. I love you. I spoke with sincerity, but it wouldn't happen tonight. I had no idea if she picked up on my lack of response. But at the time, I didn't care. I walked up to the desk and opened the envelope Molly had handed me. It showed my wife cheating on me with Justin. After recovering and cleansing my teeth, I returned to the crime scene to insert the flash drive. I opened the program and saw a complete video of my wife having fun with Justin. After an hour of severe emotional torment, I began to feel wrath well up inside me. Yes, I was heartbroken. She was selfish and disrespectful. I couldn't put into words what I'd just observed. My rage at Justin would undoubtedly build. But right now, I was filled with rage at the woman I thought loved me and had promised to be my faithful wife for the eight years of our marriage and the year before that when we were engaged. I had never really considered being with another lady. I'm not saying I never glanced or had a momentary notion. I wouldn't mind jumping on her bones if I saw a lovely woman. I am a man, like everyone else. However, it never occurred to me to break my vows to my wife or to damage her by infidelity. I started remembering how the prenuptial agreement had troubled her. She was outraged that I had implied that she could not be trusted. I now see she was a narcissist who cared only about herself and her pleasure. She didn't seem to realize the level of commitment I believed love demanded. So while this news devastated my heart, I was also outraged. There was no way this was going to be ignored. No way. That was the last word. The next few weeks were going to be difficult, but screw her. Now I'd do my part with the goal of getting away from that bitch as soon as possible, and Dr. Justin, her big stud, would pay. The next morning, I ate some fast food tacos for breakfast. I didn't lie about getting stuck at Taco Bell. Two glasses of coffee helped wash the taste away as I set out in the morning to meet my new friend Ed and pick up four new tires. Ed seemed less cranky. He grinned as I stepped in. I guess he realized he could sell my tires for a few hundred dollars in cash and pocket the money without the IRS knowing. A couple of deer heads hung on the wall, as did a photograph of him squatting next to a dead deer, a bow across his lap. Perhaps he'll use the money to purchase a new compound boat for next season. I'm not sure why, but the concept made me feel a bit better by 11.30 a.m. I had four new tires and had run out of excuses to go home. During the ride, I began to consider how I could play with Lynn's head. The idea of touching her made me cringe. Before traveling home, I made a stop near Des Moines. I arrived at the residence around 1.30. 
Lynn's automobile was in position. As I stepped in the front door, Siri began playing some soft jazz. It sounded similar to Norman Brown's Just Chillin' CD. I turned the corner and entered the kitchen where Lynn was swaying to the beat of the music while washing dishes. She must not have heard me enter. I grabbed her blasted tie. You scared the crap out of me. Let me go, you bastard. I just made a mark on her neck. Maybe it's Dr. Banks' turn to be jealous. Surprises and novelties. Yes. Neanderthal? No. What the hell? Ty? I bet you made markings on my neck and I'll be embarrassed in the operation room on Monday. That isn't what I meant, Ty. It's just that you terrified me. I think I overreacted. I'm delighted you're home. Come on, let us head upstairs. I immediately let her go. I turned around, took up my stuff, and walked up the steps. Just forget about it, Lynn. Perhaps you can simply inform the gang that your foolish husband got carried away and brutally wounded your feelings. I'd never talked to Lynn like that before, and because I was standing with my back to her and not expecting a response, I couldn't see the expression on her face. All she said was, whatever you say. I unloaded my suitcase, had a fast shower, changed into my Saturday clothes, and descended the stairs. When I came downstairs, Lynn was texting at the kitchen table. She placed her phone face down on the table and glanced up at me. There was no forgiveness in her eyes, but I believe the fury had also subsided. She was messaging with Ty. Leave it alone, Lynn. I have been gone for a week. Two more days than I had planned. All I could think about was getting back to you. But obviously, my coming over and attempting to spice up the relationship did not meet with your approval. You were the one who instructed me to hurry home so you could touch my bones. I apologize for not knowing how it was supposed to occur. Enjoy the remainder of your day and evening. I'm leaving. I didn't give her a chance to answer, but I'm sure she was surprised. Even when we argued, I never yelled or spoke in a harsh tone. We had disagreements, of course, but they were mostly measured and respectful. I just walked out the door, got into my car, and drove away. I went to the clubhouse, dressed into some casual golf attire, and whacked a few bags of balls. Following that, I focused on my poor pitch. I sadly assumed that with the advent of bachelorhood, I would have plenty of time to shave a few strokes off my game. Unfortunately, given the circumstances, that did little to improve my mood. A few hours later, I relaxed into the men's locker room, got a beer, and talked about various topics with a few other doubles players. One of them was Tom Harris, a local investment banker and a close friend of mine. While we were conversing, I discovered that his wife, Connie, was out of town for the weekend visiting family in Denver, so I invited him over for dinner. We arrived at the Mulberry Stith Tavern downtown right as it opened at 4 p.m. We enjoyed a few glasses of bourbon and had their excellent burgers. They were showing the Cardinals and Mets game on the large screen. With my hectic schedule, eating a burger and talking about pitching staffs with a friend made me feel like a little piece of normal. And I was grateful. We left about 7 p.m. and I checked my phone. Lynn sent six text messages around 30 minutes apart, beginning an hour after I departed. Ty, I sincerely apologize. Please come home and we can chat. Ty, where are you? Come home. Please stop ignoring me. Ty, I know you're seeing these texts. Go home immediately. What? Ty, don't claim I didn't ask you to come home. I am not the one who is acting like a stubborn asshole. No, I thought to myself. You're a lying, cheating slut. I said nothing back. Instead, I visited the neighborhood movie theater. I saw a new film called Firestar about a girl who realized she could set things on fire simply by using her brain. I wish I had discovered her and brought her to Banks. The movie concluded shortly before 10 o'clock and I went home. As I approached the home, I noticed Lynn's car was gone. I can't say I was disappointed, but I did understand she was probably being consoled by her partner. I returned to the club for a few beers before heading home about 11.30 p.m. Lynn was back. She was seated on our bed. Thanks. I can't believe you left without answering my texts. Where did you disappear? Her tone was forceful, implying that she regarded herself the injured party. Okay, in sequence. Tom Harris joined us for a club supper. Take a movie home. Back to the club again, since you weren't present. Then back again. And you? She lowered her eyes for a minute and did not meet my stare. Nowhere in particular have you been with anyone. Not really. I met a friend at Grounds for Celebration Coffee Shop. With whom? Does it matter? We need to discuss what happened earlier. Okay, talk. 
Ty, I apologize for reacting the way I did, but your aggression startled me and left me bewildered. You threw me off balance, making me defensive. Your grabbing and caressing did not turn me on. Part of my affection for you stems from how much you respect me, and your behaviors did not convey love and respect. Lynn, I acknowledge that my actions were unusual, but the fact that you requested me to spice things up a little a while ago appeared to indicate that you wanted to introduce something new to our sexual relationship, something more radical. If that's not it, please explain it to me so I can understand where you're going with this. That is what I stated. But I was thinking romantically. A candlelit meal or a weekend at the beach filled with embraces and kisses. I apologize, Lynn, but we have done all of those things numerous times over the last eight years. Weekends away, long walks, holding hands, and romantic discussions by the fire. I do not believe what you are saying. It does not add up. It is true, but only in a few areas. Nonsense, Lynn. I recall our chat extremely clearly. You cannot recreate history if you have changed your mind. Say so, but you don't have to lie and say you didn't propose I spice things up physically. Ty, why are you behaving like this? You're quite literal and dogmatic. I may have said it, but how can you take it as bending me over the counter or leaving a bruise on my neck for all to see? Lynn, do you remember what you were wearing when we spoke? What? No. Why does this matter? It's essential since it's pertinent to our discussion. I was working in the yard after taking a shower and leaving the bedroom. I have never seen you like this before. I'm very sure we didn't come up for air for at least an hour. So how can I transition from here to a romantic weekend on the beach holding hands? I will let you choose ten men of your choice. Tell them the narrative and ask how they would perceive your invitation. If at least nine of them do not say anything similar to what I did today, I will buy you any new car you desire. That's ludicrous, Ty. No, it's not ludicrous. It's completely factual. When you dress up for your hubby and tell him to liven things up, it's not because you're feeling romantic again. You're attempting to modify what happened in order to prove yourself correct and me incorrect. Ty, your intransigence is getting us nowhere. Why don't we just let things go and you come into bed and cuddle me? Sorry, Lynn. That will not work. If you don't like my behavior, that's fine. I will not try again. But you don't have to be foolish with me and insist that it's my fault. You care more about people seeing that I gave you a hickey than about my thoughts or opinions. I am not interested in keeping you, so you can assume I have admitted my mistake. Good night, Lynn. With those remarks, I turned and walked towards the guest bedroom. Ty, come back. I'm not finished talking to you, damn it. I ignored her. Assume my initial attempt at LH was successful. I avoided making contact with her without revealing myself. I seriously doubt she was putting two and two together to get four. She was too bashful to even entertain the possibility that I knew she was cheating on me. There have been chilly days in our marriage, but on Sunday we simply froze. We avoided each other. We did not talk. I spent the majority of the morning at the club and the afternoon working in the yard. I went to bed before she did, and when she entered the bedroom I was already in bed. I will not sleep in the same bed with you until you apologize to me. I don't mind, Lynn. I am not the unreasonable type. So I believe we will spend every other night in the master bedroom. The bed is both mine and yours. So I will sleep here tonight. If you don't like it, you know where the extra room is. Tomorrow night, I will sleep there, and you are welcome to join me. I don't agree with that. Go to the guest room and sleep till you feel better. Lynn, I have no idea why you believe you have the final say on everything, but you don't. We are equals, and I treat us accordingly. I'll sleep in this bed tonight, and anything you do is up to you, bastard, she hissed as she exited for the guest room. The first several days of the week went similarly. We barely talked to each other. She kept trying to push my buttons, but I couldn't handle it. On Monday night, she told me about being humiliated in the operation room by her co-workers who mocked her about a hickey. I shrugged indicating that I did not care. Stan Rosen called Tuesday morning and asked me to come to his office. First, some awful news. You have a very mild case of chlamydia. You most likely have not had any symptoms. More than half of the males who contract the condition do not develop symptoms. The good news is that with therapy, the condition will resolve swiftly, though you will need to be rechecked in around three months. Perhaps I should ask you how you contracted it. Of course, Stanley. I got it from my wife. I trust that our doctor's anonymity is protected here. I haven't slept with a lady since the previous year. 
Lynn and I became engaged. Last Thursday, I learned that she was having an affair with another man. I can only presume she contracted it from him, unless she has other partners that I am not aware of. He detected the melancholy in my voice. I'm sad to hear that, Tyler. I've always felt you had a good marriage. I'll give you your usual dose of azithromycin. As I already stated, everything should proceed smoothly. To be safe, you should inform Lynn about it and avoid having intercourse for the following four weeks. No, Stan, but I'm going through a difficult transition here, and I'll need to consult with a lawyer before disclosing this information to my wife. How deadly might the infection be? It does not kill, but if left untreated, it can result in major health problems, including the loss of a woman's capacity to reproduce. Lynn is either at or nearing term, depending on when the infection occurred. A few weeks is not an issue, but the more you wait, the greater the risk. Besides, Ty, as much pain as you are in, you don't want to live with the responsibility of potentially endangering someone else's health. You're correct, Stan. I can't live with myself if I fall to that level simply because I'm in agony. But let me ask you something. I have not detected any symptoms in her. So is it reasonable to assume that it's still early and she doesn't know what she's contracted for? Maybe. Maybe not. Some women experience no symptoms, but this does not preclude the condition from causing significant harm. I can't tell you what to do in that situation. But I will argue that waiting more than 48 hours is wrong. We shook hands, and he said he'd take the prescription to the neighborhood pharmacy, which I rarely visited. I appreciate it. He is concerned about my reputation. An hour later, I was in Sharp's office in Los Angeles, explaining everything to my attorney. He laughed at my FWB technique, but urged me not to make myself too obvious. He became much more serious after learning about STDs. He sighed and continued. That changes things. I understand that we sharks are lawyers, but even I cannot afford to keep someone in the dark when there are major health hazards involved. It was my time to laugh at his successful legal jokes. Doc gave you 48 hours. You should act in 24. Let me consult with a few buddies. I respect you and expect you to arrive tomorrow at 8 a.m. precisely. Lynn didn't arrive home until after 10 p.m. Her shift finished at 6. If she expected me to demand to know where she had been, she was in for a disappointment. I was watching an episode of Only Murders in the building when she came in. She gazed into the den for a moment, sighed, and went upstairs without saying a thing. Under normal conditions, she would have sat next to me and snacked on popcorn and I'd have brought her some white wine. I felt an immense sense of sorrow knowing that this would never happen to her again for the rest of my life. I was betrayed, and I was not going to stay with the cheater who had betrayed me during our marriage. But I adored her. Part of me still did. And that half wept for what was lost forever. The next morning, I was sitting in the conference room of TC&C Corporation. Sharp was present, as was Molly's private investigator and one of his lawyers, Mick Sawyer. We dislike the timing type, but it is time to pull the trigger. Everyone agrees that STDs alter the picture. Have you considered how you want to tell her yet? Yes, I had. One of my goals is to keep her off balance until she has served. What if you know I am notifying her? She will, however, remain unaware of the source of the information for the time being. Everyone at the table stared at each other skeptically, but stayed mute, waiting for the next step. What if I emailed her OBGYN an anonymous report that Lindsay Clinton, one of her patients, has chlamydia? Isn't she bound by her hypocritical oath to educate her patients? Later on, you could affirm that it was me. Molly could attest that I composed the message and confirmed the date and time. I would be behaving with reasonable good faith because my doctor required me to notify her within 48 hours, and I finished in under 30 minutes. It may be dangerous, but she will have the opportunity to receive the medical care she requires. Doesn't that pass the smell test in court? There was a pause. Molly and MC waited for Sharp to think things over. After a few minutes, he stated, Not perfect, not even good, but not terrible either. It will make you appear petty, but it is neither negligent or criminal in the appropriate conditions and with the correct judge. It may be fine. However, it is incomplete. Any judge will want to know who knew about your behavior and what steps they took to discourage you. So, Tyler, I'll tell you right now, I don't think you should do it. And it is a horrible idea. Neither do I, Molly replied. I agree with Eli Tyler, Mike said, grinning from ear to ear. 
You should not be doing this. Sharp also responded angrily. Eventually, she'll realize that if it wasn't Banks, it had to be you. She will realize you know about her affair. Yeah, but it will take me a day or two to prepare to meet her. Thank you, everybody, for your advice. However, I am determined. So after I leave here, I'll call Dr. Pamela Connors and leave her a message. In that case, I'd like to be a witness. Molly answered, I don't want to be told later that I just assumed you'd do everything and never check to see if that happened. We discussed a few more details before I departed. Forty minutes later, Dr. Connors received an unusual message from an unknown person. On the other end was Molly Elkington, a private investigator. Dr. Connors, I've opted to remain anonymous, but I am aware that one of your patients, Mrs. Lindsay Clinton, has a sexually transmitted disease, chlamydia. You now have this information. I am confident that you will instantly serve as her attending physician and support your patient. Thank you. Are we finished with the conversation? I shattered the phone into bits. Later that afternoon on the way home, I chucked it into a pond approximately five miles from my house. There was no one there to see my utter disrespect for Iowa's littering regulations. Molly was parking outside Dr. Connor's office when a black Honda Accord pulled into one of the available spaces, just as I was discarding the burner. Lynn stepped out of it, looking a little unkempt, and entered the office. Forty-five minutes later, she emerged looking considerably worse. Molly followed her to the neighborhood drugstore, where she obtained a little prescription bag. Lynn eventually returned home. I sat on the porch and watched the Cardinals' ten. Zero triumph over the Royals. Because we still didn't say much, she didn't say hi and simply walked up the stairs. About a half hour later, she emerged onto the porch, newly cleansed, and quickly lowered herself next to me, letting out a long sigh. Ty, why don't we declare a ceasefire and return to our place? I do not know, Lynn. How do you propose that we proclaim a truce? How about we just finish this argument? Lynn, I am not sure if that works for me. Why not? Ty. She appeared to truly want to know. Perhaps the information about her STDs startled her a little. I am happy to forgive and move on, Lynn. I've apologized multiple times for misinterpreting your spice. Change it up a little. Comments. But as far as I know, you still don't believe you have anything to apologize for. Thus, declining to do so appears to imply that you win while I lose. I'm not trying to win, Lynn, but I believe we're both to blame for the last several days. But you don't see it this way. Fine she said with a tiny anger in her voice. I am deeply sorry about that. So, is everything okay now? No, Lynn, it is not okay. I've known you for nearly ten years, and I know when you're not saying what you believe you're saying. Your words may be correct, but your tone demonstrates that you haven't changed. Tell me I'm mistaken, Lynn. Explain where you're wrong, and we'll move on. She looked at me for a minute, her eyes filled with melancholy. I assumed she was going to tell me about the entire cheating incident. Given what I had heard on the tapes, I did not expect a true apology. But perhaps I was mistaken about her. Could I forgive her and work on our marriage? Honestly, the concept terrified me. But I shouldn't have worried. Her eyes revealed her identity as she returned to her righteous fury. She still blamed me. At that point, I knew without a doubt that our relationship was gone. You are simply so stubborn. Tyler Adam Clinton. I apologized, and you tossed it back in my face because it didn't meet your expectations. Okay, okay. You're the one who brought us to a dead end. And it is your fault if we do not find a method to resolve this. Okay, Lindsay Abbott. Simon, she explained, carefully mentioning her maiden name. I'm sorry you feel that way. But I can see from your eyes and the tone of your voice that you may be saying the right things. But in your heart of hearts, you believe you are innocent, and I am guilty. You believe I am proud and unreasonable, so I'm offering you a bargain. If you can discover one of our close friends who honestly believes that I am an arrogant jackass who never apologizes or admits his mistakes, I accept your conclusion. She stood up, glared at me, and stomped off the porch and into the house. I took a deep breath. It had been over a week since I discovered her apparent contempt for our marital vows. The following two weeks would be virtually impossible. It was time to look into choices— the following morning, I was at my boss's office. Connie Silverton was a fair and firm supervisor. You don't become the CEO of a large medical facility without it. It wasn't easy, but I explained my predicament to her. 
I needed counsel and assistance to get me through the following 14 days until I could serve Lynn with divorce documents. Connie's answer was professional and kind. First and foremost, Tyler, I am deeply sorry for your circumstances. My parents split when I was 10 years old, and it was terrible. However, before we begin, I need to know that you will weather the storm and continue your excellent work for me and Unity. I can't do it if I know things are about to explode up and go to hell. Connie, I can't promise I'll be all right for the next few weeks, but I genuinely enjoy my job and the people I work with. I look forward to assisting you in the future. I am profoundly hurt, but I am not dead, and I have no intention of abandoning my work for the woman who betrayed me. If I can tone it down a little, I guarantee I'll be there for you 100%. Tyler, I think I know you very well, and I know I can count on you to be honest with me. There is a meeting for hospital CFOs next week in Washington, D.C. I have previously refused your requests to go due to the cost. However, this year, I believe it is in Unity's best interests for you to go. It will start on Monday and end on Thursday afternoon. As I recall, you have family on the East Coast. So why don't I authorize your participation and allow you to spend the weekend with your family? That part will have to be paid for out of pocket. Deal. I would hug you, boss, but I know you'd spank me. And I don't want Mike to interpret my gratitude in the wrong way. Mike's husband was a retired ranger colonel. But no, this. I will never forget your kindness, and you will never regret assisting me. She grinned as brightly as I had never seen her do before. I'll complete the paperwork today, Tyler. If you can make it by next Sunday, I'll buy you a week. Now get your ass out of here and plan how we're going to sign a new contract with the nurses. Their union representatives are negotiating vigorously. I stood up, smiling. Consider it finished, boss. By the way, if I can save 5% on my next contract, can we discuss my year-end bonus? Her usual expression returned to seriousness, signaling that it was time for me to leave. I barely had three days till I had to travel for the conference. Hopefully I'd just be in suspense for two or three days following my return. I managed to concentrate on the rest of the day and do a decent job, even irritating Jody Meyer, the nurses' union representative, when I informed her that their most recent offer was false. Allow her to cook throughout the weekend and next week. I thought to myself, maybe she'll be a little more stressed if her parents find out she doesn't have a contract and isn't even supposed to. On my way home, I called my father and brother to let them know I'd be in the neighborhood over the weekend and would love to hang out with them. I apologized for the short notice, but both agreed to set out time to get together. I didn't want to share the bad news with them, but I knew they'd be supportive once they heard the complete tale. My final call before hitting the journey was to attorney Eli Sharp. I quickly brought him up to speed and he informed me that this was an excellent time to contact one or two of Mary's men online and obtain additional evidence of her betrayal. Lynn was not home when I arrived, which is odd under normal circumstances. However, nothing extraordinary had happened in my life for more than a week. It was the second day of her three-day vacation, and we should have had something planned by now. At this point, she may have been enjoying fun with Justin or another man. For all I knew, that was the first time I recognized she could have or had other guys. Now that would be good. I wondered whether there was a slut running around the banks behind his back. Maybe I could write him an anonymous note asking him to keep an eye on his cheating slut so I don't end up becoming her next victim. I decided to go for a run. I had done some cross-country running in high school, but I was never really good at it. However, exercising three to five miles several times per week helped me clear my mind. My route was primarily to and from the golf course. A couple of good hills on the way back gave the run a nice cardio component. Today, I ran more intensely, hoping to exhaust myself so I could sleep that night. My world was collapsing around me, and because I had shifted into survival mode, I rarely allowed myself to pause to assess my situation. It felt good to run and think. Lynn's cheating depressed me. Nine days ago, I was in love with a woman who I thought loved me just as much, if not more. Learning that her vows meant nothing to her shook me to the core. How much of it is my fault, I wondered. Climbing hill hash one, not an issue. In a marriage lies entirely on one person. Perhaps I was overly busy or preoccupied with my career. This is not it. Sufficient time and attention. As I continued on my way, more questions came to mind. How would she react? 
Would she ever admit to what she had done? Would she make excuses or ask for forgiveness? I knew I wouldn't stay in the marriage after such a deep betrayal, but how would I feel about her when I saw her in the hospital? Would I become angry seeing her, seeing other men? Would she stick around or would you leave town? I couldn't imagine her leaving as if defeated. She'd be too stubborn for that. No, I assumed she would stay and try to prove to me that I had been a complete fool to divorce her. It dawned on me that if I was thinking so much, then I wasn't running hard enough by the top of the second hill. I was no longer preoccupied with thoughts of my slutty ex-wife. I was just looking for little things like oxygen. When I got home, I was completely exhausted, which was actually the purpose of the run. I walked up and down the street for about 20 minutes, cooling off, and then hopped in the shower. Then I put on my swim trunks, grabbed a beer, and headed for the hot tub. As my calf muscles were letting me know they hadn't appreciated the last hour or so, Lynn was still nowhere to be seen. Later, around 11 p.m., I ate dinner, watched two episodes of Ted Lasso, and finally crawled into bed. Lynn never showed up, wrote, or called. I did her the courtesy of leaving her alone. It was the only time in our entire marriage that we had been separated for more than 12 hours without contacting or knowing where the other was. I took two melatonin tablets and four Motrin tablets as my collarbones were giving me no rest with their complaints. I slept until seven the next morning before I went down the stairs in the morning. I noticed that Lynn's door was closed. Apparently she had come home the night before. I listened for a moment. Nothing moved. I drank my coffee and ate a couple of bagels, showered, changed clothes, and headed out to the golf course. The weather in Des Moines in late May can be amazing, and today was no exception. I teed off a few balls on the course and joined a couple buddies for an eight-ball game and then lunch. By 3 p.m. I had run out of excuses to stay here and headed home. I didn't text or call Lynn all day, and she ignored me too. I guess we waited to see who blinked first. When I got there, she wasn't home, and I started repeating what had happened the night before. Sunday morning was the same, but I was heading out of town on the 4 p.m. swap flight to Reagan International. I spent most of the morning cutting grass and working in the flower beds, something Lynn and I usually did together. When she finally showed up around 11 a.m., she just looked at me through the door and went back inside. Screw this, I thought as I gathered my things. If she wants to stay on the sidelines and be quiet, then let her be. But there was no way in hell I was going to let her run the game. I left for the airport without leaving her a note or message to let her know where I was going or how long I would be gone. I figured she probably wouldn't even notice. I'd been gone all week. I hoped she would notice, and I hoped she'd bring asshole Justin over and sleep with him in our bed so I could add that to her list of naughty things she'd done on Tuesday. Two things happened. First, I got a call from Eli telling me that Mary's relatives already have some new pictures and videos of Lynn and Banks. No doubt they were doing well. The second incident surprised me. Lynn finally texted me. The message exchange was not polite. Where are you in Washington? What? I'm at a conference of hospital CFOs that Connie asked me to attend. When were you going to tell me? You inconsiderate bastard. Whenever you got home before one or two in the morning and didn't talk to your husband who'd been waiting for you since six, both Friday and Saturday, where were you every night? She ignored the question. Ty, I was scared to death that something had happened to you. I can't believe you did that to me. Why? You just text me? I wrote and you didn't write back. Lie. Hash one. If you texted me and I didn't respond, did you call the police? What? When you were scared to death that something had happened to me, did you call the police? Well, no, I guess I didn't think of that. But still, you're such an asshole for not communicating with me. What about my boss or my dad or my brother or any of our friends? Who have you been contacting, trying to track me down to make sure I'm okay? I've contacted several people. Don't try to blame this on me, Ty. Lie has to name them. What name who you texted or called so I can check? I will not tolerate insults from an insensitive and uncaring asshole like you. Well, Lynn, you may think I'm an asshole, insensitive and uncaring, but I'm not a liar like you. If you were really concerned about my well-being, you would have texted me, and we both know you didn't. Second, you would have reached out to some of our friends, co-workers, or family members, which we know you didn't. What we don't know is where you were Friday or Saturday night. Care to elaborate on your whereabouts? Maybe you have something to confess to me. Dear wife, you're just insanely stubborn, Ty. 
and right now you're just pissing me off. Well, Lin, you don't seem to be capable of telling the truth or taking responsibility for what you've done or are doing. So one more thing. Screw you. There was no response on the other end. Just radio silence. Was she beginning to suspect he knew something? Did she feel any guilt for her treacherous act? Did she consider her act of infidelity? I realized I was breathing hard and sweating like I'd been working out for an hour. I pulled myself together, showered, and headed to the conference. The rest of the week went okay, considering my marriage was over and I was an emotional. I managed to make some good acquaintances and attend a couple of informative panels. The weekend with my dad and brother went well, but hard. Both tried to be understanding, but neither of them shared my experience. My mom passed away about three years ago at the age of 63 from a rare form of cancer. She left holding the hand of the man who had loved and cherished her for 41 years straight. My dad could understand my sadness, but not the pain of Lynn's duplicity. He thought she was crazy. My brother Elliot had already been married for 11 years to an amazing woman named Mary. Everything seemed to be going well for them and their three children. Even when they hit some bumps in the road, Mary and Elliot still looked at each other with adoration and resolved their infrequent arguments quickly and without too much anger. My brother seemed to be on the same marital path as my father. I was happy for him. We played a couple games of golf, took in a game of national, and had a great lunch. I enjoyed socializing with my nephews. Sunday night came all too quickly when I hugged my dad on the side of the road at Reagan. He took my face in his hands, looking sternly into my eyes. I know it hurts like hell, son, but you'll get through this. Lynn has proven to be selfish and destructive, but you don't give up. Keep moving forward, one day at a time. I know it's true. The pain will subside. With those words, he gave me a hug, jumped into his Ford F-150, and drove back to Springfield, Virginia. By the time I arrived at DSM, it was almost noon. I headed into the office to iron out some details and to see if Jody Meyer had started to come out of the woodwork in our negotiations. During the week of my absence. The good news? Her latest offer was much closer than the previous one. The gap was still there, but it was clear that the nurses didn't want a prolonged work stoppage and knew that Unity would behave reasonably at the bargaining table. Before leaving, I glanced into Connie's office. She looked up and gave me her usual look. What the hell are you going to waste my time for? I froze for a moment and smiled. Well, hey, boss. Just wanted to say thanks again for last week. It was a good seminar. It was well worth the investment. And the time spent with my family was just what the doctor ordered. As if I care. Tyler, have you had time to do anything useful since you got back? Not much. Just one over the nurse's latest offer and thought I'd let you know that by the end of this week we'll have deal that we're happy with. There's no need to thank me. Get the hell out of my office, Tyler, and come back when you actually have something for me. I always liked that teasing, but today it seemed more important than usual. Before I turned to leave, I stopped. Hey, boss! Connie looked up. What? I love you too. I jumped out the door before the pen she was holding in her hand darted toward my face. Sometimes, a normal life working with people you love and respect was the best medicine in the world. Maybe Dad was right. Maybe the pain would begin to subside. On the way home, I, my lawyer, to see how our case was going. Within a minute, Eli Sharp was on the phone. Stop by my office at 7 tomorrow morning. On your way to work, Ty. I think we're ready to pull the trigger. As sad as it is to admit, Lynn kept doing it with her idiot partner over the weekend. I won't reveal the details... Although we do have some candid photos of her in a very revealing schoolgirl outfit at their favorite hotel. When I arrived at the house was dark, quiet, and empty. It seemed like it was over between Lynn and me. We had hardly seen each other for the past three weeks, and we hadn't had a normal conversation since I had left for a conference in Kansas City over three weeks ago. I realized how much I missed her. Not the slut she'd turned into, but the Lynn I'd married. Fun, curious, mischievous, beautiful, and strong-willed. She was the person I thought I would spend the rest of my life with. I dropped my bag in the laundry room, grabbed a beer, and settled in on the back porch as the sun disappeared in the west and the stars began their nightly dance. For all my anger at her betrayal, I found myself crying again. I knew that one day I would have no more tears for her or our marriage. I would never tolerate her duplicity and infidelity. 
If I could find a way to set Justin up, I would. My pride was wounded but intact. But tonight, I allowed myself to mourn what was lost. By 10 p.m., I was beyond tired. So I headed upstairs, took a quick shower, and fell asleep 20 seconds after my head hit the pillow. Since we slept in separate beds, I didn't hear her come in. It could have been five minutes after I fell asleep. Or it could have been three in the morning. I didn't know and I didn't care. I got up and out the door around 5.30, and wanting to get in a quick workout before meeting Silas and the team at 7. Lynn's car was parked in the driveway and the door to the guest room was closed. If I understood her schedule correctly, she had the first day of a three-day shift. That was helpful. We wouldn't have to cross paths much in the coming week. Ty, good to see you. Come on in and have a seat. Eli greeted me. Super Private Detective Molly was in place, as was one of Silas' assistants, an older woman in her fifties named Peggy Simons. Her name was Peg. Molly smiled and said, Hello? Peg asked if I wanted coffee. After a minute or two, we got down to business, Sharp began. We'd like to put Lynn on trial at some point this week, Ty. Molly has received more than enough evidence showing your wife's infidelity. Repeating the same thing won't help our case. And you already own Molly. Over 6,000. So I'd thank her, but I'd let her go spy elsewhere. He smiled as he said the last sentence. It was obvious they were good friends in turn. Molly just Eli on the shoulder and got up to leave. I hope you get things settled as quickly and painlessly as possible. Tyler, she said as she shook my hand. I thanked and told her that I sincerely hope I never had to hire her in the future, but would be more than happy to tell anyone who needed her services where to find the best. Eli and I exchanged a few ideas on how, when, and where to service Lynn. I was hoping it could be done at work at a time when she and a piece of shit Justin would be together in a room full of people probably at the end of the day on Thursday, since that would be her last day of work. Before her three days off, Eli felt that such a long wait was only playing into Lynn's hands. Waiting means giving her a chance to find out what's going on. You've kept your composure admirably over the past few weeks, Ty, but you must be at your limit now. May I suggest we serve her tonight, or at the very least tomorrow? One of Molly's boys has been watching the hospital, so he'll have an idea of when is the best time to surprise her. I agreed that was reasonable. Last night I'd cried every tear I could shed over that lying bitch. I was ready for the final confrontation. My thoughts went back to my favorite Clint Eastwood outlaw when Josie confronts his three enemies. So guys, are you going to pull out your guns or just stand there and whistle Dixie? The challenge was thrown. The fight on. Sharp also found an obscure state law that allowed me to sue Justin Banks for alienation of affection. Eli was sure it would go nowhere, but the embarrassment of having everyone at the hospital know about it could seriously hurt his relationships and career. After medical school, I was in complete agreement. We agreed that Eli would call and give me a heads up when the case was done. I would be home on the back porch and talk to Lynn there. Sharp also wanted to have proof of this conversation in case things got out of hand. He asked Peg to see to it that one of Molly's boys set up surveillance equipment on our back porch and be in the car around the corner if things got heated or Lynn got rowdy, he could call the police. I couldn't imagine Lynn going that crazy. But then again, four weeks ago, I would have called you crazy if you suggested that my wife would cheat on me with a medical student. I spent the afternoon emailing Jody Meyer about the latest stumbling block in our contract negotiations. By 3 p.m., I was exhausted. We reached an agreement. Neither of us were 100% satisfied, so it was probably a fair agreement. The nurses got a decent raise in base pay over time and vacation days, and the hospital got a five-year contract instead of the three-year contract Ayana had hoped for. Even Courtney had to smile when I put the papers on her desk to take the board of directors. I was a five-minute walk from home when my phone rang. It was Eli Sharp. So, Barrister, how are we doing today? Sharp grinned. Sorry, Ty, I know it's hard for you and I'm not trying to make your situation any easier, but I've just heard from Molly. She's volunteered to take care of Lynn and Banks. They had just undergone a lengthy surgery and were in the staff lounge with another nurse, the surgeon who was operating, and Mike Devlin, the head of surgery for all of Unity Healthcare. He came in to observe as the chief surgeon was Alex Greer, one of the best cutters in the world. Devlin and Greer went to Yale together at one time, so they socialize a lot. 
Anyway, Molly showed up in the staff lounge looking like Molly, which would scare almost anyone. And apparently, medical student Banks was offended the presence of a non-medical person in their personal space. He stood up and asked her if she was lost when she said she wasn't. He replied something to the effect the area was off-limits to anyone outside the medical staff and she should leave. Now I'm quoting Molly. Can you believe this little piece of shit talks to me like that? So I pushed him back in his chair and leaned in closer. I'm pretty sure that's when he started peeing. I threw my best Chicago look at him and said, Are you that married woman? The goddamn piece of shit known as Justin Banks. He barely squeezed out a yes. Well, son, you've been served, she continued. The room got pretty damn quiet, and the other four were staring at me when I turned my attention to Lynn's roguish slut. I thought she was going to melt. I took a much nicer tone with her, but I guess everyone could hear the sarcasm in my voice. And you, sweetheart, are you? Lynn Clinton, Tyler Clinton's wife. She nodded her head affirmatively and replied in a barely audible whisper. Yes. Well, in that case, I assume you are very familiar with Mr. Banks, and you, my dear, have been served as well. Molly told me it was one of the best moments she'd had in the last few years. She wanted to savor it while it lasted, so she hesitated to leave. Dr. Devlin turned to Banks. Young man, if you have done what I think you have done, you will never medicine in Iowa or anywhere else, if I can help it. He also turned to Lynn, putting two and two together and addressed her directly. Please tell me you're not that stupid, Lynn. She hung her head, and as Molly was leaving, she heard Devlin say, Lynn, you'd better go home and not come back to work until one of your union representatives speaks to you. Sharp finally stopped giggling and pulled himself together. So, Tyler, your wife got the summons and is on her way home. Molly's boyfriend is about a block away and will be set to work. Get ready, son. I think you're in for one of the worst moments of your life. Be firm, but don't yell and scream. If it gets to be too much, just go for a walk or go to another room. You'll get through this with Tyler. The hardest part is over. We chatted some more, discussing the way forward. I got the impression that Eli wanted to stay with me as long as possible, helping me prepare emotionally for the potential shitstorm that was about to erupt. As we were about to finish talking, I heard Lynn's car pull up to the driveway. I thanked Sharp and told him I'd call him when we were done to get an update. Lynn walked through the door and found me on the back porch. Looked terrible. She had obviously cried her eyes out on the way home, when I looked up, I thought a mixture of sadness and rage was staring back at me. She started. How long have you two known each other? Three bloody, miserable weeks. Lynn, how did you find out? Not that it matters, but I came home early from a conference in KC to surprise my wife and spend some time with the woman I loved and cherished. When I arrived early Friday, you weren't here. I checked my glimpse app and saw that you were somewhere near the airport. From that point on, things went downhill fast. That morning, when you called me about the pen, yes, you lied to me. You set me up. Well, I guess if anyone knows what lying is, it's you. Since you've perfected it to an art form in your dealings with me. But yes, I lied. I wasn't trying to set you up. I was trying to determine if my world was really crumbling around me. Unfortunately, it is. She remained silent for a moment. I didn't want to ask her anything. Now that everything was out in the open, I just wanted to deal with whatever had to be done and get away from her. Finally, she continued, I can't believe you made me service myself at work in front of my co-workers. I was humiliated. Take a number and get in line, Lynn. That was just cruel. Your approach leaves us no chance to sort things out. I repeat, Lynn, if anyone recognizes cruelty, it's you. Your betrayal is the cruelest thing anyone has ever done to me in my life. No matter how long you cheated on me with Justin, you unleashed cruelty after cruelty on the man you said you loved. Also, let me be very, very clear. I have no desire to build a relationship with you on any level. I'm divorcing you, and I'm not looking back. You must be delusional if you think you can treat me like this, and I'll want anything to do with you. Finally sat down on the other end of the couch for me. But Ty, I love you. I understand what you're saying, but I never meant to hurt you or be cruel to you. Justin, just a little fling. I know it was wrong and I shouldn't have done it, but I know we can work through this as adults and grow stronger. Lynn, I'm trying to keep my composure, but you, you just ruined our marriage. Any reasonable adult can understand that. Yes, 
I've seen pictures and videos of several of your escapades at the Hampton Inn Airport. You be such a child to think that if you play the part of the grieving wife, I'll just ignore the pain and hurt you brought into my life. I can't believe you were spying on me and Justin. Ty, why didn't you just talk to me about it when you found out? I could have ended our relationship with him right away. You took it to the extreme. Lynn, I shouldn't have spied on you. There shouldn't have been anything secret between us, especially infidelity. Why would I talk to you about anything? Nothing that comes out of your mouth will be believable to me again. Extreme is the infidelity of your faithful husband. Lynn, look in the damn mirror for a moment and pray that you see the truth. I had no idea if my suddenly idiotic wife understood any of this or not. Nothing seemed to get through to her. She was just looking for an easy way out to brush off her betrayal. Every time she opened her mouth, more nonsense flew out. Tied divorce is the last thing we both want. Not only do we live here, but we work at the same hospital. What will people think? It would be so embarrassing if we got divorced while living and working in the same place. And also how humiliating for both of us. If co-workers and friends some of these details. Come on, baby. You realize how bad that would be for both of us? Lynn, I've been living with embarrassment and humiliation since that Friday morning when I saw you and the jerk walk out of the Hampton Inn right after you lied to me on the phone about where you were and what you were doing. The divorce will be a welcome relief to me because the attention will be directed at you too when people find out about your betrayal and debauchery. I'd ask you if Baby Banks was your first and only extramarital affair. But no matter what you, I won't believe you. Thank God we don't have children yet. The thought of raising kids with you makes me sick. Why the hell would you want to stay married to a man you have zero respect for? Ty, what can I say to make you realize that Justin was just an infatuation, an affair, nothing more? No emotion. No love. I realize now that it was wrong of me to fool around. But of course you should know that I love you and only want to be with you. I promise that from now on, we'll never even look at another man. Well, Lynn, if you say so, let me tell you, you must be the most delusional whore that ever walked the planet. You lied me and cheated on me for months. Then you gave me an STD. You contracted from your boyfriend, and I'm supposed to just say, Okay, Doki, honey, don't worry. Let's just pretend nothing happened and go back to the honeymoon. Let me be very clear, Lynn. I will never touch you again. I'll divorce you as soon as possible, even if I'm financially screwed. I'd rather live in a shack, destitute and alone, than in a mansion with you. The pain I've been experiencing for the past month has been beyond me. If it wasn't for thee of family and friends, I'm pretty sure I'd be lying face down in a ditch right now. You did this to me, Lynn. Your cheating lies, callousness, and utter hatred for me almost me killed. But you didn't, Lynn. I'm still standing on my feet, and I intend to go on my way as best I can, keeping you in my rearview mirror and never looking back. I don't know if I managed to get through to her, but tears came to her eyes. I apologize. Ty was all she said before heading upstairs to the bedroom, starting to realize what she had done and the consequences that would follow. Sorry isn't all there is to say about you, Lynn, I said in response. Six months later, we were divorced. Neither of us wanted the house, so it was sold and we split the equity. Everything else was pretty much 50-50, too. But I ended up winning on alimony because the judge didn't award it to Lynn. When he ruled, Lynn's attorney started to protest, but the judge interrupted her. Miss Bannister, your client should be grateful. I am constrained by law to award her a 50-50th split. I don't like dishonest people, and she clearly cannot be trusted to tell the truth on any level. She gets everything legally required to give. The rest is at my discretion, counselor, so don't push your luck. Court is adjourned. I do not know. Maybe it was just me, but he sounded a lot like a duke. Epilogue. My name is Connie Silverton, and I am Tyler Clinton, supervisor at the hospital. My husband Mike and I were very concerned about Tyler and the suffering he went through because of the actions of his bitch of a wife. The divorce was finalized, but that wasn't all. First of all, for several months, Tyler was not himself. He had to put up with Lynn's constant harassment and stalling during the divorce process. However, Eli Sharp is a good man, and he took care of Tyler all along the way. Tyler suffered a lot financially because of all the costs. But at the end of the day, he was a free man. Very talented and young, so I knew he would eventually get back on his feet. Although it's been over three years since his divorce, he hasn't started dating yet. But he has good people around him. 
and apparently a certain girl from Cedar Bluffs who is in town to visit her, and Beth has caught his attention to the hospital staff. Lindsay had become an outcast. None of the married nurses wanted anything to do with her. Several of the most obnoxious doctors, both married and single, tried to get her into bed because they had all heard from Justin Banks what an easy lady she was. Six months after divorce, she filed her resignation. After moving to Denver, she started working at a hospital there. About a year after that, we learned that she had married a young surgeon, a rising star. A few of our crew met her at a seminar, and she seemed to have decided she was a better person after leaving. In her words, her first loser husband, Tyler Banks, was also ostracized, even by some of the more snarky doctors. Tyler had such a good reputation throughout the hospital that even those doctors who considered themselves players wanted nothing to do with him. He finished his residency but received only mediocre recommendations when applying for a job. Banks ended up working at a regional hospital in Frankfort, Kentucky, earning probably half of what he would have if he had been a decent man. He also married a fine southern girl, and from what we hear, they have been happily married three years now. That's it except for one small detail. Last night, my husband Mike, retired military, took Tyler out to dinner. This is a little unusual for him, but not completely unheard of. We enjoyed grilled steaks and good wine. After dinner, Mike asked us to join him in front of the big screen in the living room. Tyler. I looked at each other with a what the hell? Look. But Mike had captured our attention. He assumed his old army colonial pose and began Tyler and Connie. What we see and what we talk about tonight is for just the three of us. What we see will be destroyed and will never be remembered or mentioned again. I knew this side of Mike and nodded in agreement. Tyler noticed me do so and replied, Okay, Mike, whatever you say, Tyler. Almost four years ago, a disgusting and a piece of shit caused grievous harm to a man that Connie and I love like a little brother. We have spent many hours talking about this injustice and praying that someday, perhaps, somehow, the scales will balance. As you know, I have many friends and contacts in government during my 24 years in uniform. I've accumulated quite a few debts over the years, and over the past 12 months I've turned to several markers. Please watch the screen for the next 20 minutes. We watched two videos with our mouths open in. Shock. The first was about Dr. and Mrs. James Thaddeus of Denver, Colorado. Mrs. Thaddeus, the former Mrs. Tyler Clinton, was sobbing and screaming at her husband. You bastard! How could you do it? I've been faithful to you since we were married, and today I get a video of you cheating on me at the Hampton Inn. You bastard! Hate you! I hate you! How could you cheat on me and ruin our relationship? Get out of my house now! When Dr. Jim got up and left, Lindsay just sat there sobbing until she picked up the envelope, opened it, and read... Betrayal hurts like a bitch, don't it, slut? The second video showed Justin Banks standing outside his home in Kentucky. It appears he was in a quiet neighborhood with no other homes nearby. His sweet southern wife was tearfully holding a handful of glossy 8 asterisk 10 photos of her husband cheating. At that moment, three large men began to approach Banks. One of them was dressed in a sheriff's uniform. So, bastard, did you think you could screw over our sister? Get away with it. There won't be a piece of you left to identify if your body parts are ever found. Banks cried like a baby before the screen went out. A uniformed man was heard to say, By the way, Tyler, Clinton's friend Colonial Silverton, sends his regards. Another scene appeared. It was a gorgeous young woman, similar, the one in the video and photos. She simply smiled into the camera and said, Mission accomplished. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a story to share about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.